Feel Good Fathers, welcome to the show. I'm joined today by Victor Juice Freddy, and we're going to talk about two things I think are really, really critical. The first being self-talk and how we speak to ourselves, and the second being uh, a solo, solo father. I, I know you're going to love this episode. Victor and I were just jamming for a couple of minutes off, off air, and I could already see that we had some great uh, synergies going on there. In addition to all of this, some things to know. Victor is an author and a coach. And down in the description, you'll see a link to his, uh, it's a guide, it's a practical guide to start addressing your self-talk. Victor, welcome to the show. Hi, Jay. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Excellent. So self-talk, let's, uh, what's the primer? How can we, how can we introduce this to feel good fathers? Sure. Uh, self-talk came up because you asked a very good question and it's something that I would like to address or to share with other fathers out there. And I thought to myself, well, what's something that really made a massive shift in my parenting journey? Uh, and it all began, it all began on an afternoon when my kids are sitting down having snack and they're playing and giggling. This is just after my second divorce at 36. I also had just gotten laid off from my job. So I was 24 hours a day with my kids in, in a 700 square foot apartment. And I'm, I get a message from my ex that really shook me and I'm having a breakdown in the bedroom. And I'm just sitting there and just sobbing my, my, my eyes out and not understanding what just happened. And amongst the, the chaos in my own head, I hear the kids stop laughing and stop giggling, which in children, that's a sign that something is not right. And when I... As, as soon as I come out of the, be the bedroom, I see that there are two glasses of chocolate milk spilled all over the place, all over the dog, all over themselves. And I have a breakdown and I, I scream something along the lines of, I told you guys not to do that and I'll have to clean all this. And in my anger fit, I smash my phone on the floor. And at that moment, I had a realization where I saw in myself the thing that I didn't like in other people, especially how I was treated and how I was raised. And, and this other side of me that responded to certain events or to certain novelty per se, but it didn't respond the way that I would like to or, or, or that I prided myself in being. He responded like the Mr. Smith of the movie, right? He took over my ego and then he just made a bunch of chaos and then went away. So that led me into... Uh, many, many, many rabbit holes. And the conclusion is that most of our behavior stems from the way that we talk to ourselves, the things that we say, the things that we think, and also the order in which we think them. And um, and that led to the, the the thing that I would like to share with other dads, and it's how self-talk changed my life as a father and pretty much my life in general. I'm blown away by the second part of that not so much the self-talk i think uh we'll get into that piece but talk to us about the order of the statements i that i had i've never heard that that's brand new to me uh it's probably brand new to uh a few good fathers that are listening uh what's with the order of these statements <laughs> so the first thing i realized in, in an, uh, an educated form, just, just by introspection, is that there were certain patterns in my thinking, and each of those patterns led to a particular result. Later on, I, I took a couple of certifications and I learned neurolinguistic programming, and that is called mindset strategies. So it's, it's a sequence of events that lead to a specific result. And many times we inherit those sequences of, of events based, of, based on what we believe and what we believe that our actions are going to, to yield or produce. Um, and that's, that's what triggered the whole thing. It's not the same thing to say uh, the dog bit Johnny, then Johnny bit the dog. And, and they both cause different emotional reactions within us and therefore actions afterwards. Awesome. Can you provide an example of... Uh, either from your life or something that is common for fathers that they would say in a sequence and what kind of result that would create? Yeah. A, a personal example is the kids just being rumpusy. And I, if I tell to myself, there they go again, making a big deal out of it, I have to go talk to them and tell them to stop fighting. And then 
because if I don't tell them to stop fighting, then it's going to get to a worse event and then they're going to stop. They're going to start hurting each other. And, and, and we build this, this, this narrative in our minds and, and, and because one thing leads to the next, but what if instead of saying, after, I, let's say I recognize me saying, Oh, they're, they're have been rompacy again. I have to go talk to them. How about changing the next frame of that conversation and from, because this and this is going to happen to, well, how about I let them handle it on their own? And then we'll see. And so that, that, that break, that change of direction per se, uh, gives you an opportunity to, to create some space between what you think you should do and then your reaction. And, then, and that's how we become wiser, right? Sometimes my dog runs off the property and I'm, I'm, I'm scared that he's going to go to the, to the road, but maybe... I let him go a little further and a little further until I realize that my dog won't go further than the neighbor's house and then he'll come back each and every time. And that's how we find that piece instead of being freaking out every single time that the dog is running and I have to go catch him. And so, and so it's choosing the next piece of your thought pattern after your, your, your trigger or, or, or your interpretation of an event and then just giving yourself a chance to maybe see another perspective. I really, I really like this because I, 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 I find myself catching myself and, and rewiring. I mean, the first, the first privilege is, uh, as parenting is a privilege is this concept of there's nothing that I have to do. There's, or nothing that, oh, I'll have to do this. It's always, I get to, right. But right? that that's for me, that's the first context, which like I if agree. I had, you know, I don't, I don't have my, my kids don't typically argue with each other. They're many years apart. So there's a different dynamic. Uh, but I, I will find, oh, uh, my oldest didn't do the chore, you know? And so where I've been, I think, you know, in the past, I would have thought something like, oh, she's lazy. She doesn't respect, she doesn't do this. <laughs> like all these different excuses to simply, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's young. She's in sixth grade going into seventh. She's learning how to manage her time. She's learning uh, about her identity as a family. She's learning about her personal identity and who she is. And so there's an element here of, of, of oh, here's an opportunity for me to explore with her, her thoughts and pride on the house, her thoughts and pride on, on the family. And then a simple reminder of, this is your responsibility. Here we go. You know, here's right. your responsibility. Uh, this is your contribution. It's sort of yours to own and do as needed. Uh, but it's really appreciative when you do it on time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> yeah, I can relate. I can definitely relate. Um, and, and, and that's, that was the other part that ties into self-talk, I think. And it's because if, as we talked about before the chat, it's, modern science has proven that, that reality unfolds as we speak. And it, this is nothing new. I mean, even if you go to the oldest hermetic text, that's what it says. The universe is in constant motion and whatnot, right? So if that's a fact, and it's a fact from the, the origins of the knowledge that we've been passed on to people who are confirming it now through modern, whatever their processes are, because I don't understand them, then how can you be wise enough to know where that path is going to lead. And in, in, in my example, my example is rather extreme because in my childhood, if I didn't get up at first call, I will get a glass of cold water thrown in my face or, or my sheets pulled off and me dragged off bed. And, or if I, and if I didn't make my bed four corners, then I'll have to make all of the beds in the house. And if I said no, then I will go into a corner and I'll be there until I was allowed to leave, right? So, so I was the under the other end of the spectrum. That the really, if you don't do this, you're gonna be severely punished. And that's something that took me a whole lifetime to unwind and really see why, right? Because I, I don't, I don't know about you, but I wasn't explained why not to do something or why to do something and see that you do or die sort of thing. Um, and and uh, and when it comes to the kids, they, I, I realized that. I suffered a lot emotionally when the results weren't what I was expecting. My, so when they didn't meet my expectations, such as clean your bedroom once a week, you know, whatever, clean the yard. And, 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 I, and it never occurred to me to think beyond that. I didn't think, well, why? Why is 
you know, why is this such a big deal? Why is this worth it? Me generating an uncomfortable emotional state in my child, or why can I show them the 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 side of the responsibility? For example, cleaning your room, right? It's it's it. Be, besides being a help to to a, for example, for me, I clean their rooms every day and their and, and their clothes and and everything that they do because I'm twenty four seven a mom and a dad. But uh, what if I? told them they say hey cleaning your room actually feels good if your if your room is organized and because my daughter is she's she's 10 and my son is eight he's a gamer and my daughter's an artist and so if your room is organized you'll have better ideas you're going to come out with better products and 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 they try and they test and they're like oh that is right right and and so then you give them the tools and then they can make their choice and you also free yourself from from that burden of saying well it has to be this way I love the, there's a, an implicit discovery in sort of what you're talking about that uh, in addition to the enrolling and the sharing of the experience, so rather it being a burden, right? This is the privilege versus the burden perspective where, oh, I have to go do this thing. And that's the self-talk versus uh, there's the privilege aspect of it, which is definitely the feel good father way. There's also your, your kind of, uh, talking about a shared experience right. that there's a, a way that you're speaking to yourself that translates to how you speak with your, uh, with your son and your daughter. Um, absolutely adore that. That's really fantastic. Okay. Um, how does, um, what, what do you do uh, given this context, given this self-talk to help your son and your daughter? Like, how are you taking this expertise that you have right now? And translating that like as a stamped on skill for them. Well, it depends on on which facet of of growing, um, and because we do it in, in many different ways. But besides being the child of a tough childhood, I also been a nomad, so I've lived in about fifty places around the world, and everything that that entails means moving with a, just a bag, you know, you have to leave your toys behind, your dog behind, your friends behind, your grandparents behind, and you move and you move and you never really have a place of belonging. But you also get to experience a lot of things. Uh, and then having faced my worst fears and, and, the, and the things that co- couldn't go any wronger, even if I don't, I don't think that's a word, but you get the point. And and realizing that one doesn't die, that it's that it's our our decision how we face and how we overcome. And, and then again, it ties back to self talk because you. There are many times that, that a, a father or a mother or just a regular person, and, and they, they 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 their body can keep going, but you can't, right? And and that's when self talk becomes the most important because it's 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 yourself that pulls you out of that hole or lets you fall in. And so, sorry, to, to answer your question, I try to translate that as much as I can into the, the life of the kids. My daughter had the, the state PSSA with some testing that takes about three days. And everyone in school is making it this, this big deal. And they're sending requests for encouragement letters. And they're preparing them mentally for how hard this is going to be. And I take the opposite approach. I said, Sweepy. This is not going to have an impact in your life because I know because I went to school and all of the things that happened in school did not have an impact in my life. And I said, also, I explained to her the the concept of the subconscious and the conscious, how our subconscious is this big computer that saves everything. And your conscious is just um, responsible for dealing the here and now. And when she faces that test, everything that she's learned throughout the months is already stored in there. She doesn't need to remember it. She just needs to take it easy and do her best. Um, and so that, ironically, has provided the opposite results of pressure and, and, and exigent expectations. And both my kids are in, in the Gifted Children program. They get invited to all of the extracurricular activities and and, and they get student of the month every other month. And, and to me, I don't really care. <laughs> but but the, the fact that I teach them how to talk to themselves properly and have the right outlook, it's what allows them to actually do their best. I mean, kids are already in that zone, in that zone of perfect performance all the time. And it's us with our fears and our limiting beliefs that sort of start putting them in this box until they grow up to be the adults that they grow up to be. This is bringing up, I, 
I, I think this is fantastic. Number one, you've already learned everything you're going to learn. It's not a matter of, of you're continuing to learn the information's in there. You just got to do your best. Absolutely love that. What a great growth mindset. What I'm curious for, and I think some of the feel good fathers that are listening are also probably curious about is when, when did you really take this on? Like, when did you learn it? What was the moment? How are we applying it to the next thing? Well, I learned it at eight years old when I had been playing with some friends and their mom gives me some money for an ice cream. But instead of me going to get the ice cream, I go inside the house because I know my, my dad is there. And so I wouldn't, so, so I would get punished often for little things. And so I wouldn't have to face any punishment. The first thing that I do is I walk in the house and I say, the neighbor gave me 50 cents. And he didn't believe me. He thought that I stole him. So he makes me go in the bedroom and he whips me with a belt. And in this disconnection, because in my mind, I hadn't done absolutely anything wrong. I had accepted this gift from the neighbor. And, I, and I'm actually being forthcoming and telling him so I can see, so I can earn his trust, right? And, he, and this, this plays the other way. I will never forget that by the third belt whipping, I detached from pain physically. And that was the moment that I became conscious of thinking about what I was thinking about. And from then on, that you know, one thing led to another. And, and I began realizing that it was what I told myself that made the difference. Uh, for example, you know, my dad is, is guilty for a lot of things, but also guilty for a lot of good things. He's my stepdad. And he once said, two words that never should come out of your mouth is can't. I, I can't. And every time I faced a tough and challenging situation, I just told myself, I, I, I'm not going to say I can't. I can definitely figure out a way. And, and that led one thing to another, which led me into uh, a, a sports career with, with sponsored, like, as a sponsor athlete doing downhill mountain biking, motocross. I launched a business, uh, I'm sorry, a music band, seven businesses. And it's always been that way of talking to myself. Uh, that has taken me to the next step. And I learned it from a lot of different ways, that, from philosophy, from uh, the military. For, I, didn't, I, I wasn't in the military, but I had friends in the special forces. And these guys are exposed to some really tough training exercises. And what makes some stand apart from the other is how they talk to themselves in that moment. You know, can I continue? And and seeing what they're capable of and seeing what a lot of other people are capable of makes you realize that it's it's not in your skill set, it's not in your body, it's not in, in, in what you possess, it's it's in something else. And 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 that's how I got more serious about the things that I thought and the things that I that I said to myself and analyzing the order of my thoughts and eventually almost fix finding the, the combination for this Rubik's Cube. Uh, between what I thought, my emotions, and then my actions. I, you know, it's funny that the experience is, is relatively sim like similar to what I had growing up, but a little bit different, but in a um, similar kind of experience with my stepfather, et cetera. Uh, I think that the, um, the, the, the weirdest thing for me, right, is that in self-talk, in circumstances, I think we were talking about studies in neuroscience that we have something like 10,000 thoughts a minute and something like 9,500 of those, 95% <laughs> like of them are negative. So, and that, and that's called negativity bias for, right. for the feel good father listening. And it's, it's part of our survival mechanism. It's a part of, uh, our lizard brain. There's, no reason to beat yourself up about it. There's no reason to do anything about it. It has served you well. It has kept uh, every, every in your generational line. It's part of the reason why you are alive today. Uh, however, it doesn't always serve us in our day-to-day -day life. And I, I love the fact that, because uh, I, I was aware of the self-talk of the special forces. I, I did know that uh, from not only uh, Jocko Willenick's extreme ownership, but also some of the the SEAL team uh, study that I had done uh, when I was in high school. And then also, I believe it was um, uh, Admiral Admiral M of Make Your Bed, right? Macmillan, I believe it is, of Make Your Bed. And, and he kind of talks about it a little bit there in the self-talk there as well, that mental toughness, that mental fortitude. So now we're 
now we're in the fatherhood realm where we have a really great background. We understand where this comes from. How, what are the kind of common situations that you've seen of things that fathers say to themselves and what could they say instead? Well, I can tell you what every father says to themselves because then I'll be lying to you as if I had this power of reading people's minds. But I can tell you that I know why they tell themselves and that is why they've been told all their lives. So we are in this rather unconscious state for the first few years of our lives, for I think four to eight years or so. And we absorb like a sponge. We can't we can't reject anything. We just take it in and take it in. And that's how we build our operative system. And th- that is how we're going to react to things that we don't know. And, and, and that's what happened to me. That was a slap in the face by reacting to my kids the way my dad had reacted to me in, in the past. Not, not to such extent, but still. And so it's very common when I work with, with divorced dads, especially, it's that they, their inner talk, their self-talk is their dad's talk and they have a little bit of their mom's talk, but it's usually the one that demanded the most that commands that conversation. And it could be anywhere from you're not worth it to whatever titles your, your ex spouse or your current spouse has labeled you with. And it could be the things that you believe uh, about yourself based on what others told you and the, and the proof that you gathered through life. Right. Um, which is how we build beliefs. Um, And so that's a very common situation among, among dads is it's that the the number one hindering element to, to improving their self-talk is this, this, this inner critic, this almost tyrant in their mind that is always looking out, like always making them do things or forcing them to do things. Uh, And that's, that's how we learn to behave unless you actually take a conscious effort and say, Hey, how is this benefiting me? How is this benefiting my, my children? Um, and, and what would I gain by changing it? And what would I lose by continuing on this path? I think that's fantastic. One of the, one of the core elements of the feel good fathered way is to start thinking long-term, you know, and I think of when you're writing that future self letter, when you're, when you're reflecting on the family you want to create, the person you want to be, I find myself sometimes saying, okay, well, is this the kind of person, like, is this what I would say? Is this what that person, that future self would say to myself? Would future, would that future version of me, would he speak to himself this way? And I think part of, part of that, I, I think part of what we're kind of dancing around is this concept of like, what's actually consciousness. There's living in a reactive state where you're not really making intentional decisions, where th- you're getting stimulus and response. It's a very, it's a very video game, very like Pav- Pavlovian response thing going on. And then there's the other side, which is difficult to cultivate. It is a skill that can be developed, which is the thinking about what you're thinking about, thinking about how you're reacting, thinking about why am I feeling this emotion the way that it is. And, you know, as an example, uh, as of this recording, this past week, I did a major guffaw at work, major guffaw. And so from the W2 corporate world that I came from, if you make a mistake, you get fired. Right. And the entire, and it was so, it was so interesting because when I was going into it and I realized that I had made this mistake, my first thought was, okay, I need to make sure that I don't let my teammates down. What can I salvage here to make sure? everything's good business that they get money, all this kind of jazz. Like that's the first thing I'm going to go die in the sword. I'm going to go (coughs) figure out what's going on, do everything I can to make itself. And so that was like, that was keeping me in it. But what I found is that over time is that more and more that nervousness of like, am I going to get fired? Am I going to get fired? Am I going to get fired? Like, is this a major offense? And it just took a long time because I recognized it took me a couple of days. It's been four or five days. I'm sitting here and I was like, Oh, you know, that day I already talked to my chief officer, the guy that's completely responsible for everything that my department does. And he was like, look, everybody makes a mistake. You just got to move on. He was like, Hey, like you made a mistake. You did everything you could to fix it. It's being taken care of. Everything's great. But it still took me that time to 
it's okay. Everything's gonna be okay. I'm, I'm still doing this great. I'm still doing that kind of stuff excellently. And I think that that pattern, you know, from a very experiential version of me of saying, okay, I made a mistake. I know I made a mistake. I want to do everything I can to rectify it. All right, I've done everything I can. Now I need help, right? You can come in and help me, but still feeling that trepidation. I think most fathers, most feel good fathers have that experience. In fact, I think most people have that experience of, all right, I've, I've, I'm here, this. So from my personal experience, it took me four days. I'm still kind of a little bit like, uh, you know, like <laughs> working, working through the negativity of it and the self-talk. But what would you tell me for, you know, for the benefit of, of our four fathers? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because uh, <laughs> if you would have caught me a couple of days ago, my answer it wouldn't have been different. But I was learning a new meaning of that. Right. Because I said, well, in your case, well, in my case, I've had over 40 jobs. And I also know that the history, the, the stories that repeat over, you know, movies, cartoons, books, they're, they're true because I've lived them. That means that when you think that you're about to sink, something else comes to your aid and then everything comes together. And, and I'm not sure if it's happened to you, but I think that it's rather a common experience that we find ourselves at the end of a road and that end of the road is the breakthrough to a new one. And then when we look back, we say, man, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. If you really think about it, I mean, yeah, sure. You might, you might want to avoid certain pain points and whatnot, but some things just seem to always work out. They, they for some reason is the future is perfect. Right. And, but in my personal experience, I, I, the kids were away this weekend. They're, they're away every other weekend. And we took a trip to Scranton with my fiance. And when I come back, I find a sheriff's card stuck on my door, right? <laughs> and I'm like, the sheriff? <laughs> so, I, so I call the sheriff and he says, oh, yeah, I have some papers from the court to serve you. Now I'm thinking, what the hell? What, what, you know, what, what, and I go through my head and I do a mental check of, of, of things that I could be being searched for. Nothing turns up. Not, there's nothing that matches the, the, the description of what he's trying to do. And I put the card in my pocket and say, well, you know what? This is, this is great practice for developing minds. And now I'm finding my, finally, I'm finding myself in a spot where I'm uncomfortable. So let me see what I can do. And what did I do? I said, well, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. I, I looked at my past and I said, every time something I'm called for happened, something equally magnificent followed it. And so this is happening for me, not to me. And then it went away. And later during the day, I noticed the thought again and the, the, the worry about like, oh, what could these papers be about? Who's trying to make someone trying to sue me? <laughs> you know? And then I said, well, whatever it is, it's going to be. I, I can't change it. I cannot go into the future and change the result. And, and why would I even want to? I don't even know why this is happening, right? So let's just, let's just let it roll and trust in myself that no matter what happens, I'm going to be able to handle it. And so that coupled with looking back and seeing how many times I messed up and how many times I've, I've, I've been at the end of the road and also remembering that I was able to just not only overcome it, but find a gain in it, give me the piece that I needed, right? So the morning comes, the morning comes where the, the sheriff is supposed to come, and I pull the card out of my pocket, and I turn it around, and it says a different name in the back. <laughs> so I call the guy, and it turns out that the papers weren't for me. It was for the person who was living in this house before. And and see, there's a saying, uh, the, the, I think... Um, I forgot if it's Marcus Aurelius or Seneca that said it, but it's him that suffers before it's necessary, suffers before it's necessary. I'm sorry, suffers yeah, more was, than uh, necessary. Yeah, that's that's Seneca. Yeah. Right. And and in your case, what I will tell you is this. I say, Jay, well, the mis you made the mistake, right? The 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 it, it, however you want to look at it, whether you want to look at it through the lens of religion to science or or the loss of the universe. Uh, what you put in, you get out. So now you are putting in your best intent, your best effort to correct the mistake that you realize you made. Because many people will likely avoid it or bury it under the under the rug, and then it becomes somebody else's problem. But in your case, you took the the, the heroic path. You said, you know, 
this is a dragon. This is something that I'm, I'm afraid of, but man, other people depend on me. So I'm going to go and I'm, I'm going to go put this sword right through the dragon's heart. And, and that's what you did. And then the bigger dragon is that you're going to get fired, but you also know that when, when, or if it comes to that point, that you'll be able to overcome it. There's, there's nothing that, that can shake you. And, and you have a choice on what to believe and how you talk to yourself. You can either tell yourself, Jay, you're going to get fired. Your friends are going to be, you know, think you're a fool. Uh, you're not going to get another job. Your, your wife is going to divorce you. Your kids are going to go away. And you can go through worst case scenario and say, well, if that happens, which is out of my control, I did my best. It's happening for me. How can I make the best of it? And that's how these these Navy SEALs make it through Hell Week, for example. And some guys can't even make it to a 30-minute exercise. I absolutely love it. And uh, it, it's so funny. Thank you so much. You've reminded me of, of, of so many things, right? Everything's going to be okay. Uh, I was thinking of uh, the other thing, too, is like, what's the evidence for the, the, the self-flagellation, so to speak? Like, what's the evidence for this? Uh, is there evidence for these kind of things? And and those kind of jazz and I absolutely love it. Uh, I know for me, when, when this airs, I'm probably going to go back and listen to this again on occasion <laughs> and feel good fathers. You know, you can just hit that rewind button and just like back up a couple of minutes and just kind of go through this and just replace Jay with whatever your name is and just kind of go through it and see if it's really helpful to you. Um, so this has been super fantastic. And I think we've kind of buttoned up this, this particular aspect of the talk. I'd, I'd love to get your take on uh, being a, a, a single father, a solo father. Uh, this is like, you're in a co-parenting relationship. We, we did talk about it off air. Uh, give us the background here and, and, and what are your experiences? Yeah. I, um, so after my ex-wife says that we are getting separated and there's nothing I can do to fix it. I live in my car for a few months until I get an apartment and in the, in, in the same town and the apartment turns out to be the exact same apartment that we moved out of before getting the house. So, so now it's been two years and, you know, the holes, the, the, the patches on the wall that my kids <laughs> made are still there. And, and now it's, this is, it's sort of this emotional prison. So that, that made it harder. But once I get that apartment about January, three weeks later, my kids show up at my doorstep and she's gone. And, and that's when I see what's happening and I start caring for them full time. I get laid off a couple of months later, COVID quarantine hits. And now we're, you know, it's all three of us in this apartment. So the first thing that I realize, uh, because I'm going to make it succinct for you, it's the value of a woman in a man's life and how these, these roles that we've always talked about, um, there aren't just stereotypes or ideals. They're, there are a set of rules or a set of parameters in which each of us performs our best. And, and it, that's also part of the self-talk and the beliefs and whatnot. But I realized how much emotional support children need, how many little variables one has to be taking care of every single day to make sure that the machine is well oiled and works. Uh, the, the exigences of having to take them to school, prepare their lunch, wash their clothes, dress them up, give them a bath, to all of the little things that women do when we as men are the provider. If, if, if it's, it fits like a semi-standard, I don't even know anymore, uh, a relationship, usually the man is the provider, the woman is emotional support for the family and whatnot. And that's usually seen as a bad thing, right? Oh, well, but in my case, I realized why that is valuable because the emotional support that a mother can give a child, it's nowhere near what a dad can uh, what not? I'll, 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 yes, you can, but not what we're accustomed to. It's a part of you that you have to sort of break out of its shell, this emotional side. And up until that point, I have been a, a, a tough guy. I mean, I, I've lived in the most dangerous cities of the world. I've, I've been uh, robbed at knife point. And so from that moment on, I realized that I had to become just as dangerous as these guys. So I was going to be robbed every time I went to school. And, and, all of these things that made me this this tough guy that you couldn't you couldn't get through. I know, I know martial arts. I know Krav Maga. So I was like, you know, you know, if you if you if you, even. and and that was the opposite of what my kids needed. So the first thing that I realized was how the value of a woman and also the value of your emotional development because we're also cheating ourselves of the most beautiful experiences when it comes to that. Somehow, I believe that experiencing emotions or or displaying emotions was a negative aspect of manhood. And um, 
And I came to realize that it's nice. It's knowing how to properly use them, when, when to properly experience them, right? It's okay to cry out of happiness when your child does something good. It's okay to, to get angry at something. You know, we're just human like that. Um, but we do lack a lot of that emotional development. And that was key. That, that to me um, was one of the most important parts because everything else sort of becomes mechanic. But when you start developing yourself emotionally and, and getting a hold of how you talk to yourself and what goes on in your mind, everything else benefits from it. I love the balance and, and the introspection. It's it's super critical. And I think that um, the other side is also true, right? Uh, we spent a lot of time and, and the feel good father way is to honor, is to honor our moms, is to honor our wives, is to honor our partners in that, in that capacity. That on the other side, there's also that strength that fathers bring. And the elegant way that you put it was that everybody brings something unique. Everybody, everybody brings something unique. And there is... I think a unique experience when you're in, uh, in the day to day of when you're in a partnership and both parents are present, there is a dynamic that can occur. And it, and it is a, a special, I think, kind of burden for our co-parenting fathers, our co-parenting mothers, uh, as they're navigating that world with not a lot of people to lean on, right? There's not a partnership. And, uh, I love the comment that you made. Uh, I, I have a particular affinity for the, um, one of the first things that, uh, that God says in Genesis in the Bible, uh, to Adam, like one of the first sentences as spoken to a human being was you were not meant to, man was not meant to be alone. And so, uh, I, I love that, that particular element there. Um, all right. So, uh, given everything we're talking about, uh, this is, uh, Victor Juice Freddy, uh, his URL, which will also be down in the description is, uh, Victor V I C T O R G I U S F R E D I dot com slash download. And that'll get that immediate guide for fathers to, uh, rewire their, uh, self-talk. Uh, thanks so much, Victor. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and I'm humbled to be on your podcast. Thanks, Shane.